Can men love well? I'm Dr. Carol, and you're listening to Relationship Prescriptions. There are plenty of wives I talk with who say their husband just doesn't know how to love well. And frankly, a number of the men I talk with say they struggle here, particularly when it comes to problematic sexual behavior. A number of the people that I've talked with have, the men in particular, have gained a certain amount of sobriety, meaning they're not acting out with watching porn or having an affair. They, they've stopped that, but their marriage is falling apart. Uh, why? To help me unpack all of that, I have a very special guest on the program today, Dr. Eddie Caparucci. He has specialized in treating problematic sexual behavior for many years. He is a PhD level licensed professional counselor, an author, written a number of books, and has a lot of online resources as well. His practice area is men. He only deals with men. And dealing with sex addiction, problematic sexual behaviors, and all that. His special gift to those who are struggling is the inner child model. We're going to talk a bit about that and why addressing the inner child is so important. We're focusing on men today, and we're focusing on problematic sexual behaviors today. But these principles apply in, oh, just so many areas. But in particular, if you are a wife who's, you feel like your husband doesn't know how to love well, or maybe you are a man and realize there's something you feel like may be missing here, this is for you. So my conversation with Dr. Eddie Caparucci. Well, Dr. Eddie Caparucci, it is a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you. It was great to meet you a couple months ago, and thank you for being here. Yes, I mean, it was great. I mean, and you were wonderful at Stills. I loved your presentation that you did, and I am honored to be here, so thank you. Well, I have heard from people that I speak with that your material has been a blessing to them. So this is a pleasure for, for both of us. Um, let me just ask, I'm always curious about what brings people into this area, problematic sexual behaviors and just all the stuff. Just it, maybe the short version of what even got you here. Yeah, I'm going to have to give you a short one, Carol, because the yeah. long one will take us two, two three hours. Um, I had my own struggles. Started when I was 16, I was a womanizer. Yeah, I couldn't stay in one relationship. I needed to jump around all the time. Couldn't figure out what it was. It cost me two marriages along the way. After the second marriage, I said, you know what? I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. This is insane. And I went and I sought treatment. And what I found was that I had, or I don't have, what called an avoidant attachment yeah. disorder. I have one foot in and I have one foot out. What was that about? Real quick. When I was five, my father dies suddenly of a heart attack. My mother had a nervous breakdown. I get sent out. There are four kids. We all get sent out individually. I get sent to these relatives. I have no idea who they are. Nobody's talking to me. Nobody told me anything going on. So all it is is one day I'm with these strange people. And where's my mom? Where's my dad? No answers because they didn't know what to tell me. So now here it is. And then a year later, I go back home. Oh. So what? what's the worldview for this kid? This kid, one, okay, I must have done something to be sent away, to deserve to be sent away. Therefore, I am unlovable. You can't trust the people who love you, all right? So therefore, subconsciously, again, one foot in, one foot out, just put up a wall to only let people so close and not all the way in. Once I came to understand that, it changed everything yeah. because now it was like, okay, I get it. I understand. I can now make real changes in my life because that wasn't really the case. It's what I came to believe was the case. Yes. So with that, you know, and also what was going on after that, I met my current wife of 27 years. We've been together, 25, we've been married, been faithful the whole time, which is a wonderful thing. Shouldn't have to have to brag about that, but um, she really brought me closer in my relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. And in that, you know, as I finally came to understand, oh my gosh, it is about a relationship. Yes. Um, he all of a sudden came to me and said, hey, guess what? I got something new for you to do. Okay. Because I was in corporate America. 
I was a marketing and advertising executive. And he said, I have something different. He goes, you're going to be a Christian counselor. And I'm like, no, I'm not. No, 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 no. This is not part of the deal. It's not part of the deal. Well, it was part of the deal. So I went back to school, got a master's in counseling, did all the state work, did it. And I opened up a general practice, general. Key everybody with anything. Okay, I'm a Christian yeah. counselor. Well, all of a sudden these guys start coming into my office and they all look like me and where I was when I was struggling. And I was like, this is it. This is what it's about. So that's how I got into it. I went back, did more uh, certifications in this area. And here we are now, 12 years later in this place, yeah. a great place, an amazing place to be able to watch God at work every day. Amen. Fantastic. Amen. Well, one of the things, even that brief view of your story, Eddie, highlights is that God often uses our mess to bring us into what his purpose for us is, because we, we've been there. We, we know his miracle working power and also the work that it takes to, to experience a transformation. Um, what I want, uh, there's a lot we could talk about, but what I particularly want to talk about today is what you've already alluded to, some of that attachment, emotional literacy, growing up, so some of the inner work that people need to do in coming out of problematic sexual behaviors, especially men, and that's your practice area. I, we're going to assume for this conversation that people listening or watching understand that pornography, affairs, sleeping around, all that kind of stuff is not healthy, it's not godly. And I have talked with uh, people from time to time who, it's like they find sobriety. Uh, many of the uh, helps out there, online or in-person resources, okay, I stop the behavior, but what's next? Sobriety is a really important step, but then what next? Can you talk about that, what next, just for a minute? Yes, absolutely, because it became something that I noticed in my practice after about four or five years of working with these men was that their wives weren't re-engaging. Yes. And I couldn't quite understand because it seemed like they had done their own trauma work, behavior, uh, their uh, be, uh, betrayal trauma. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to wonder what's going on here. And I did some research with them. And what I found was, you know what? Yeah, he says he's sober, but all of these other behaviors that deal from an emotional standpoint point, the ability to emotionally connect yeah. the ability to be curious about me and the kid none of that's changed so if none of that has changed why should i believe he's sober mm -hmm. and it's like you know the light came on it's like you know what no you know what being sober is not enough and in my research what i came to understand was nine out of ten men who deal with this addiction are also what I call emotionally undeveloped. Mm. They did not get the guidance, the training, the nurturing they needed to do at a young age in those early years of childhood development where they learn how to attune, how to develop empathy, yeah. how to sit with emotional pain and discomfort. You know, I, I worked in, in my training before I became a counselor, I worked in a residential treatment program with uh, men and women who had substance addictions and found in every single case these were people who had unresolved childhood pain points and they could not sit with emotional discomfort that's a bit of a problem okay yes. if i have pain and i can't sit with it what do i do well we learned at a very young age Okay, we learned, we, or we taught ourselves, well, what do I do? If nobody teaching me how to sit with their pain, I won't think about it. Yes. Brilliant. I yes. won't think about how to do that. Yes. I'll distract myself. Mm -hmm. I distract myself. Too much sugar, mm -hmm. too much food, too much TV, yep. too much fantasy, all of that. Now, take that same amazing coping strategy that a kid comes up with and move it into your teen world into your adult world and just change out the behavior yes more stimulating that allows you to continue that level of distraction and that's what we're doing we just run away yeah. from our problems 
And so that, that part of that addiction, but also, again, going back to the idea of, and it's in the book, Why Men Struggle to Love, we need to be able to become more emotional being because that's the way God designed us. Designed us not just to be a, a physical being, a mental being, you know, there's a spiritual side of us and part of that spiritual side, that soul is emotions. And yet men, so many men struggle in that area to be able to do that work. So that set me on a path to say, okay, what is the therapeutic process for helping men who are emotionally undeveloped? Yeah. Thank you for putting the addiction process connected with, with pain, because I am certain nobody, man or woman, wakes up one day and says, I'm going to get addicted to porn or sex or substances or acting out in, in, in any way. It, it comes from somewhere as a, as a coping tool. And you're, you're highlighting that this is having to get to a deeper root, the level underneath just stopping a particular behavior. Right. And, and that's where the whole going deeper concept came from yes. and my inner child model for the treatment of problematic sexual addiction, which is now the inner child model for the treatment of addictions in general. But it was the idea that unresolved childhood pain points still on us today. Yeah. Because what happens as a negative event happens and we have all these core emotional triggers that activate our inner children about the past pain. Well, I'm, if I'm oblivious of those, I don't know what they are. All I know is that whatever event just happened right now has caused my anxiety to increase. Well, if you can imagine as your anxiety increases, and now here we got this little kid coming in with, I remember this pain, I remember that memory, I got this one, that all mirrors what just happened. Now your intensity level your increases dramatically. Yeah. And when your anxiety increases, compulsiveness increases. And when compulsiveness increases, bad decision-making increases. Yeah, yeah. And I would imagine that there's positive reinforcement. Okay, I feel anxiety. I do this behavior as unhealthy as it is, but my anxiety lessens. So, okay, it not only may there be a dopamine hit, and I think many of our uh, listeners will probably be, be aware of that, that, there can be a dopamine hit from the behavior, but just the lessening of anxiety is enough of a positive reinforcement that I'm going to keep going to that to deal with any negative emotion. Absolutely. The only problem is short-lived. Yes. And eventually you're going to come back to those emotional wounds until you go ahead and act out again. Yeah. And that's why in some cases we'll see those struggling with problematic sexual behaviors who are engaged in looking at pornography multiple times a day, masturbating multiple times a day, or people who are dealing with substance abuse, who are drinking throughout the day, or who are just involved with narcotics constantly, because they need to continue to numb out, plus also the addictive element of it. If I don't have it, now the body and the mind and emotions start to break down. In dealing with these uncomfortable emotions, I can imagine since your focus is men and we're particularly talking about men today, that there may be some men who say, I'm up for sobriety. I'm up for doing some work to stop behaviors that end up causing me trouble, but I'm not sure about this emotional stuff. I, that, that's not manly. I certainly don't want to feel uncomfortable. How do you help men get over some of those what feel like barriers? Well, I mean, one of the things that really helps is that in most cases it's being driven by their partner, all right, their spouse, who's saying you need more yeah. here and that. Um, it is interesting, Carol. I mean, when you sit and you start to work with a lot of these men and you say, okay, so let's talk about emotions and we bring up a certain circumstance. And then say, okay, so what are the feelings that come with that? And they're like deers in headlights. 
I mean, they can't come up with the word because again, that's another thing that we're supposed to be taught at a young age. What are the words that identify our emotions? Mm. You learn that along with emotional regulation and they don't have that skill set. So I pretty much have to retrain them. They have to be reparented mm. so that they can learn that one, oh, I do have emotions. Yeah. And some of them know that they have emotions. I mean, because again, they can get angry, they can get sad, they can be happy, you know, those basics. But in some cases, they were given a message that sharing emotions is not healthy. Sharing emotions actually could be dangerous in the sense that people will mock you over it. Yep. They will minimize you. So therefore, it's like, why bother? There's no benefit in sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, as a woman, I can um, I can hear perhaps some men pushing back and saying, "Well, you're just trying to make me like a woman. I've got to be, you know, masculine. That that this this is this is how God made me. I don't I don't do emotions. That's for you women." Um, so, I the toxic masculinity thing. Um, has has been important, but I also think that maybe some women have taken it too far, or maybe some men. How would you sort that out in how God made us as human beings, not only female do, right. not only females do emotions? Just, just to go to what you just said, when, when a, if a man says, hey, this is the way God made me, you know what, the emotional side, the emotional stuff goes towards someone else. And that's erroneous. It's wrong. That is not the way God made you. What happened was God made you to be a full being. Yeah. You at some point decided to cut apart and move aside the emotional component of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, for whatever reason, yeah. okay, you have to go back and look at that. And that's what I try to do. I try to get them to see where did that get cut off? Mm -hmm. When did you say, I'm not feeling anymore? Yeah. Because it's too, it's too painful. That's what it comes down to. It's too painful. Once they see that and they recognize it and they say, oh my gosh, so that means if that did not happen, I would do, I would have all these emotions right now. I would be, be able to feel. Yes, exactly. So are we going to allow that event that happened, that individual, yep. are we going to allow that person to continue to cheat you out of what a full abundant light should be because that was happening you're missing out on so much light it's incredible I, I tell a story of a client who came into my office one day i've been working with him for years and he's just looking out the window and he said to me he goes is it just me or do the leaves seem brighter this year wow you know, wow it goes just you it goes you i go there just this <laughs> As always, but he was now more observant wow. of his surroundings. He was appreciating nature and beauty. He was appreciating what emotions are. And you know what? And I'm not trying to get any guy to walk around with his emotions on his sleeve. Not, I don't walk around with my emotions on my sleeve. And in fact, you know what? I'm not sure I can even do that because I do believe that if men are on this end of the spectrum where there may be a zero, 10%, 15% in being able to feel and express emotion, I might be able to move them to 40, maybe 45. Okay. They're not going to a hundred, right? It's not happening, but you know what? That 40% looks a lot better than where they are today. So again, no, we're not trying to feminize men. We're not trying to, you know, minimize them in any way. What we're trying to do is get them to see there are real tangible benefits that God designed for us if we become emotional beings. Yeah. I love that, Eddie. I love that. Um, in your book, Why Men Struggle to Love You, unpack some of this, and then you get real detailed about a number of relational blind spots. Uh, specifically that, that, that men may struggle with in particular. And uh, we, we can't go through all of them, but let me just give you opportunity to, you know, to, to pick a few and, 
what are some that you see particularly commonly that they particularly affect men? Right. There, there are 14 blind spots that I've identified. And basically people say, what's a blind spot? A blind spot is something that imp impedes a man's ability to cultivate and nurture a relationship and to really get a sense of joy out of life. So just to pick a few, I'll pick some of the ones that I think are the most prevalent and the ones that have to be taken care of. Good. One we've already talked about, avoids emotional pain, okay? They can't sit with it. They need to learn to be able to sit with that pain and understand it's not going to kill them. And one of the process of doing this is to sit down, go through it, because a lot of that pain is going to be irrational thinking. Mm -hmm. It's irrational because what is it? It's based on a lot of stuff that happened in the past. Yeah. It's not happening right now. It may feel like it's happening right now. It may feel like this is the most horrible thing that's going on, but it's not. So therefore they sit with their pain and then what they do, this is what they feel. I feel this. And then I make them move over to what is real. Mm -hmm. And now here's the adult. Because what I feel in many cases is that inner child. Yeah. Now here, what is real is now the adult who's using rational thinking, using wide mind. Now, yes, some of the feelings that were over here may come over into reality. They may be there. But when you start to weed them out, now you get a very different perspective on the pain point you were looking at. And with that, now you're able to go and make a healthy decision rather than just running away, which is what most people will do, as I said before. Yeah. I'll reflect for just a moment biblically on that. You know, if, if somebody might be saying, well, God doesn't want us to not be happy. We're, you know, we're supposed to just be thankful in all things and all. I, I, I will just reflect that there are many, many places where God's best friends in scripture brought their hardest stuff to him. Many of the Psalms are lament, and you talk about pain from the past. Look at some of the dysfunctional family dynamics in the book of Genesis and how oh. that in, uh, inner child stuff that wasn't dealt with impacted generations. So there's plenty in scripture to back up what you're saying. Yes, and, and you, know, you bring up a really good point, Carol. A lot of what we see here in these men this is generational, yeah. okay? Their fathers were that way, their mother, their grandfather, grandmother, or great, great, it, it just come down. And at some point, somebody had to stop. Mm -hmm. We need to stop, we need to break the cycle, we need to start to teach our kids how to be emotional beings. So anyway, that's one. The other one is inwardly focused. Okay. And how do we come, become inwardly focused? Well, you know, take my example that I gave you my growing up. Because my belief is, you know what? When it comes to my emotional pain, there's nobody here for me. I'm gonna have to take care of this myself. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna take care of it myself. So I turn inward. And in turning inward, not only do I start taking care of my own emotional pain, I start taking care of every single want and desire I have and everyone else be damned. Mm, wow. Unfortunately, yes. that's what happens because you become inwardly focused. Yeah. You don't mean to, and that doesn't mean you'll be that way all the time. Sometimes you'll be very caring. You'll be very understanding, but the fear is the inner child is, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you become too kind, too understanding, to let that person in too much, you're opening up yourself to be vulnerable for pain. Yeah. So I got to keep that wall up. So again, being inwardly focused is something that needs to happen. We also look at, for example, the lack of curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about the lack of curiosity with things, okay, or um, events. You could be very curious about politics, yeah. finances, gardening, cooking, all that, that's fine. We're talking about curiosity with people that you sit and you drill down to understand, you know, tell me more about you and what you're feeling. You know, my wife, I, I just got my wife a horse for her birthday 
okay? She hasn't, she hasn't had a horse in over 30 years. She was so excited. And to be out there and watching her with this horse, it's been amazing. But more importantly was afterward, we've been sitting and what I've been doing is really diving further in with her mm-hmm. about, you know what, what's it feel like to just walk beside her or, or when you're, you know, grooming her, you know, what kind of feelings are you getting? What did, if it take you back to anything, that's the kind of curiosity and the men lack all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a few of them that we have. I, let me, I want to point one other one out because it's a big one and that's hypersensitive. Okay. They're hypersensitive to criticism. They're hypersensitive to um, being falsely accused to things. And with that, again, as you can imagine, becomes a lot of defensiveness yep. that we see. And that's another thing that women kept seeing, even though they're, you know, if they're sober, yet when they try, because again, women are still dealing with their betrayal. They're trying to talk about it. And the men just get so defensive about it because they can't see her pain. They're too focused on how it's making them feel uncomfortable. As you work with men in becoming uh, more emotionally aware, conversant, able to get past some of these blind spots, uh, does connection happen better? I know many people who are listening to us are married. And maybe there's some, you know, wives who are feeling hopeless or some men who deeply want to connect. Um, I have observed that there's significant numbers of men who feel like if they want to connect, they go to sex with their wife. And it's not that going to sex with your wife is a bad thing, but that that's their, the one tool in their toolbox to connect. Um, that's do right. these other things make a difference? It, do, it does make a difference. It takes time. Okay, the one thing I tell women that do this, he is not going to be perfect. Yeah. I am not perfect. Okay, my wife will come in and she'll tell you, I am not perfect. I get it wrong every once in a while. But it takes time. It takes about two years of going through this process. Because again, what are we talking about? We're talking about reparenting. Mm. This, none of this is natural for the man who is emotionally undeveloped. Okay. It's not natural. I don't have this skill. Okay. You know, it's like you today, if you say, hey, you know, Eddie, come on, you know what? I want you to go uh, to the batting cages. I'm gonna put it on, you know, the 90 miles an hour yeah. pitch. Yeah, do it. And it's like, well, one, I haven't played baseball since I was such and such, but what they never did. They never picked up a bat. You know what? I'm probably not going to do very well. I'm probably going to look awful out there. And it's very similar here. So therefore, they also need to start to get comfortable with it. But most importantly, they need to develop confidence. Mm. They need the confidence that, oh, okay, I could do this. Because again, they're very fearful. They're fearful they're going to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. They're They're fearful that they don't know what to say. So therefore, let me just shut up. Yeah. Back. That that been the MO the whole their whole entire life. It is all based on fear. Mm. So we need to go back there and we need to adjust that too. And that's actually one of the blind spots. Yeah. Thank you for highlighting that this is a process. And both for husbands who may be in this kind of a, a mindset or, or soul situation and wives who uh, love somebody. This isn't like, okay, I get one light bulb moment and, and the world is all rainbows, that it's a, it's a process. And I reflect on that, that I, I think that's how God works with all of us. He rarely zaps us from here to there. He almost always takes us through a process of transformation, learning and growth. And this is one of them. You know, I think of this, I'm glad you brought that up because the way I think of this is that we're, I'm putting men back on the pathway of sanctification. Okay. okay. Where they are learning how to, again, be more Christ-like in their walk. Now, I'm of the belief that, you know, we're going to be light years away from being Christ-like on the day of yep. judgment. But yet, to be able to stay there, and they're going to fall off. Okay, but get up, brush yourself off. What did you learn from that? That's really critical. 
then you can be able to continue to move forward with that. But yes, it is a process. And some guys, you know, some guys pick it up fast. Other guys, it takes them those couple years. And unfortunately, there are some that just never, never grasp it. It's, it's, it's too challenging for them to overcome that inward focusedness. Yeah, I'm glad is. you acknowledge that, even though that's sad and we don't want to focus on that. But it, yes, um, th- thank you for at least acknowledging that. Um, yeah, well, you know, I get I get called from women. It's like, you know, oh, I understand now, you know, about the idea that, you know, being sober is not enough and I need you to fix my husband. <laughs> like, right. Well, first right. and foremost, I can't tell you if I can fix your husband, okay? I don't know. I need to assess him. And, and, you know, make that determination because for some people, that pain, they walled off so thick and deep that it's, it's so difficult. And that's not to say God can't right. make that change. It right. can happen. But when you have a man who's fighting it, it makes it so much more difficult. Really hard. You mentioned wives. And obviously that's more who I, just because of who I am, might speak with. But for wives who recognize some of these things in their husbands, are there any ways that wives can help rather than hurt their husband's process in this journey? Absolutely. And I I encourage all of them. And I know there are some times that, you know, a woman's in a place where it's like, I just can't get involved with this right now. Okay. I get it. Understand. However, the big way to help is that as he's walking through, he identified the blind spot. Hopefully she walked through those two because he always misses a couple. And she can sit there and add those C's because as I said, he's not going to always get it right. When she sees that it doesn't happen, that's when she should, instead of talking about the stuff where she's going to be wagging her finger at him about how did you mess up? Why are you being so insensitive? How come you're being so defensive? Instead, talk about what you just saw and like, you know what? It's really disappointing that I sat here and I tried to share with you my pain today and you decided to be so defensive Mm. and walk away. Mm. It will convict. If you have a good willed man, He'll convict him. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you do all of those with each of these blind spots, because then it's like, oh my gosh, I messed up. All right, how did I mess up? And then be able to figure that out, go back, not just to say, oh, I'm sorry, but this is why I messed up because of this. Hopefully next time I'll, I'll get this right. Well, Eddie, you've got a bunch of resources. Um, for the man who recognizes himself in some of what we've talked about um, and who feels maybe overwhelmed, where should somebody start? I know you've got several books and online. I just um, we've, we've been talking out of why men struggle to love in particular today, but you've got a bunch. Where should somebody start? <laughs> well, I guess it all depends on where you're at in the whole process of things. I mean, for that person who not just maybe maybe you're struggling and you're not sober maybe you're still sober but yet you still seem to feel very haunted by a lot of negative narratives in your head i'm starting with going to the inner child work Mm -hmm. that's where i think you should be i think you need to go back and understand and answer the why question why do why do i think feel and act the way i do so they can go and find the book, Why Men Struggle to, not Why Men Struggle to Love, Going Deeper, okay? How the Inner Child Impacts Your Sexual Addiction. You pointed out something um, a little bit earlier. There's a new book that's going to be coming out, and that is Understanding the Inner Child and How to Overcome Addiction. So therefore, if you have other types of addiction, you can utilize that resource. And it's not just, you know, um, the book, the workbook is part of that, that we've done. If people want to contact me, I have trained uh, coaches and therapists on the inner child model 
as well as on the Why Men Struggle to Love. So I can send out, I can get, provide referrals to anyone who would need them. Mm. Thank you. Well, we are going to make all those links available. We'll link to your book, Going Deeper, to Why Men Struggle to Love, and your new one, Understanding Your Inner Child and Overcoming Addiction, and your inner child website. Um, I, I Yeah, there's actually, there's actually a trip. For those people who can't really afford therapy, what I put together was a 12-part uh, program where I walked them through what I do over a period of 12 weeks with somebody. So therefore they can see that. And then what I can also do with them is very, very short consulting sessions with them that I wouldn't charge for. So therefore they can make sure that they've gotten a lot of that also. So yeah, and we price that for what it costs for less than three sessions of therapy. So Absolutely. we're trying to make the resources available for everybody. That's awesome. And people would find that at your inner child website, which we'll have the link to. Yes, that's where they can find it. Inner child. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, Eddie, I am, I am just really privileged to hear from you and, and your paradigm uh, of, of helping men deal with some of these things. Again, there's a lot out there that much of it very good in helping men become sober, but there's not nearly as much in helping men deal with this inner child, the emotions, why they struggle to love. Uh, I hear these kinds of issues from wives and even on occasion, the men that may reach out and, and ask me questions. And so I am really grateful for your work and to be able to share you know, these resources with people and many, many blessings in your ongoing work. Thank you. Hey, can I, can I share something that yes. you'd be the first one, the first one to know this. Um, my wife and I have embarked on what I think may be my last book. I can't promise that, but I think it is. <laughs> and that is, that is going deeper for the betrayed spouse. Oh, awesome. That, 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 that the women who have been hurt can yes. go back and look at some of their traumas or neglect that they went through and how it's impacting the way they're handling the situation now, some of the struggles they may be having, and also that brokenness that they suffered from and dealt with, yep. how that may have attracted them to the man who was also broken. Oh, because wow. so many times we hear the question, how did I get here? How did I wind up with him? And in many cases, trauma, attracts trauma. Yep. So we're looking at that and we're hoping to have that out by the probably summer of next year. Oh, that is awesome. Totally awesome. I talk with people from time to time and it's, how did I get here again? You know, what's the common denominator? You kind of illustrated that in your own story as we began, Eddie. You know, I'm, I'm doing the same kind of thing in the same kind of relationships after, you know, two or three or more times. Well, what's the common denominator? And I love that you are putting something like that together. So powerful. Um, yeah, we're very excited about that. I got one other thing for you. We have, after Going Deeper came out, the big question I kept getting all the time was, wait a second. How come there's not a going deeper for women dealing with love and sex addiction? I go, I don't have the data. Okay, I, I don't work with men. Well, I partnered with two women who do that. And coming out at the end of this year is going, going deeper for women and how to deal with your love and sex addiction. Oh, I may, I may do a going deeper for cooking. I don't know. We may <laughs> have all these kids involved in that too, Carol. I mean, well, I am thrilled you're doing it for women. And then, uh, you know, next year for betrayed spouses or hurting spouses. Oh, this has been rich. Thank you again, Eddie, and many, many blessings to you. Thank you. God bless you. You definitely need to check the show notes for this particular episode. We've got some really helpful links there. We have a link to Dr. Capirucci's earlier work, Going Deeper. And then to the book we spent most of our time talking about today, Why Men Struggle to Love, Overcoming Relational Blind Spots. And just about the time this podcast is releasing, his latest project will be available, Understanding Your Inner Child and Overcoming Addiction. 
that very practical resource is not particularly about sexual behaviors, but about addiction more broadly. Check those out. We'll also have the link to where you can find the material he referenced about the inner child model, innerchild-sexaddiction.com. That link will be there also. Yeah, if you are a man, God created you a, a very necessary makeup with a, with a sex drive, with the need for validation and respect. Of course, evil has hijacked that. Dealing with the kinds of things we talked about in this conversation can help you get past that and become the man both that you truly desire and that God created you to be, that he wants you to become. Check out those resources. I know it will help you. I also want to invite you to come over to our website, drcarolministries.com. Check out our relationships page. You'll find the link there in the show notes. Also, we have a wide variety of resources around marriage, love, relationships, intimacy, sex in marriage, and communication, all of that. I think you'll find that very helpful. And while you're at our website, leave me a message. Come to the contact page, and if you have a comment or a question about this episode or any episode, or you just have a confidential message you'd like to get to me, that contact page gets it to me, and it's confidential. And then I would invite you to share this episode with a friend. Wherever you get your podcasts, if you're listening to this on the web, just uh, click the the, the link in the browser bar and just text it or share it on social media. If you're listening to podcasts, use the share function in your podcast app and share it with a friend that helps them. It will bless you to know you've helped somebody else and it will bless us as well. Thank you so much for being part of our podcast family. And until next time, may God bless you. <music>